Welcome to the Savvy Agent Podcast, where we help real estate agents build a thriving business so they have financial freedom in their life without having to work 24 seven. I'm your host, Heather Wright. Now let's get to it. In this episode of this Savvy Agent Podcast, we're gonna talk about no one's favorite subject, (laughs) eliminating expenses. I know, if it were up to me, We would all have all the money to spend on all the beautiful things. But unfortunately, being a business owner, a real estate agent, you know, sometimes that just means we have to be responsible. And knowing that the real estate market is kind of cray, it is probably not a bad idea to make sure that our expenses are under control and eliminate those that make sense. But there is a method to the madness because turning off all your advertising is not really the right way to eliminate expenses, even though that's probably a major expense. So yes, this is not anyone's favorite subject, but sometimes we have to do the hard things and this is one of them. And we're going to make the hard thing easy to figure out what, if any, expenses we need to eliminate. Are you ready? Welcome to the Savvy Agent Podcast, where we help real estate agents build a thriving business so they have financial freedom in their life without having to work 24-7. I'm your host, Heather Wright. Now let's get to it. So first of all, before you can eliminate any expenses, do you actually track your expenses and like have them in a place where you can pull them up right now, not a shoebox of printed receipts or like... I track my expenses in two places. I track them on a spreadsheet that I can access at any point in time. And it's a spreadsheet I created. So I also know how to use a spreadsheet. Sometimes when the spreadsheet is really complicated and you didn't create it, it's like hard to use, right? But I know this spreadsheet inside and out, so I can use it. But I also have my assistant track my expenses in QuickBooks. We have a dedicated computer for QuickBooks because that's what our bookkeeper wanted. She didn't want to use the online version of QuickBooks. So we just have the dedicated computer of QuickBooks, which is an hour away from me. That's where my assistant lives and she has that computer. And so I don't know how to use QuickBooks. I don't know how to read the reports. That is not something that I would access to review my expenses. So while I'm organized in that way, I'm double organized, I'm probably too organized, But I wouldn't really have the access to QuickBooks to be able to use that as a tool to evaluate that I'm spending my money in the areas that it makes the most sense, which is probably an area for Heather to improve in. Because as I say it out loud, it's kind of embarrassing. Like, why don't I have a better control over this situation? But truly, we only use QuickBooks for my CPA. Now, my team is selling under 20 million a year, usually. So if I were selling 100 million a year, I'd probably have a different system. So this is the system that I have set up for my small business that works just fine for me today. So those of you who are thinking about judging me, you can stop it right there. But the idea of how to eliminate your expenses is pretty much the same no matter what system you use to track your expenses. And if you do not use a system, if you just spend willy-nilly, what's that like? Does it make you wake up with the sweats once in a while or not? Because if you are just not ever worried about where you're spending your money and you have enough to spend willy-nilly, I kind of feel like you're stimulating the economy and I shouldn't encourage you to do otherwise. It sounds like your system is great and it's not broken. But if you're waking up in the middle of the night with the cold sweats, then it might be time to get the expenses situation under control. And so I think you can download my spreadsheet and it comes with a bunch of training because it is kind of a semi-complicated spreadsheet in a simple way. But I will include a link to that in the show notes. So if you do not have a way to track your expenses and your sales pipeline and understand where the money is in your business, then download my spreadsheet. I think it's called the numbers tracker because I am amazing at naming things. (laughs) But it's a great spreadsheet and it will certainly help you if you do not currently have another system. 
when I look at my spreadsheet, the largest expenses, and I'm pulling up last year's spreadsheet because this year's, you know, it's only got a couple of months in it so far. But when I look at the expenses from last year, of course, the biggest expense category is payroll. And that's because my business is an S corporation and I pay payroll for both my real estate business and my, actually my real estate business is an S corp. And it houses the LLC that is what you guys know as Savvy Agent. And so the payroll is paid out of the corporate account, which is the S Corp. So payroll has me because, of course, you are the first person that should be getting paid out of your business account. And then, of course, my graphic designer, I have an assistant. You know, last year, I think those were the only three people. No, that's not true. So let's see, there's the graphic designer, me, assistant. And then I also have a virtual assistant. Yeah. So there's actually four of us that are paid on payroll. And payroll is always going to be any company's largest expense, which is why when things start going not good, you start seeing layoffs. And so we're running things pretty tight where I don't think that anyone is being overpaid for the amount of work, but it is still a good exercise to go in and look and see, okay, well, how much did my graphic designer get paid last year? And did I receive, did the company receive that amount of value in exchange for the dollars that we invested in him? Did we get the amount of value out of our virtual assistant? that we invested in her monetarily? And my answers to these questions are yes. So while payroll is the biggest expense, it's not one that I'm willing to cut, not today. Then our second biggest expense looks like it was client expenses. And client expenses is the category, but then the payee on my spreadsheet is random stuff I paid. So I know that this category is not actually all for clients and my CPA does not listen to this podcast. So I'm certain that he's not going to know either, but courses that I purchase or, you know, one-off expenses that we did actually just have a really big gift buying where we're going to start do, putting together our own client gifts. So I bought a lot of the material that we're going to use for those gifts. But that was instead of spread out throughout the year when we have those closings, that's, you know, front loaded in January instead of throughout the year. Whereas last year, we did have closing gifts that we paid for throughout the year. And then, you know, referral gifts, just gifts, gifts, gifts. Maybe we had a, you know, client lunch, although I usually put those under entertainment restaurants. But basically, my client expenses are random stuff I paid. And so that is the second largest expense. And that means that I need to go through these categories and look at what are the random things that you're paying? And are you overspending on courses? Probably I happen to be a course addict. And that is something that I could set a budget for this year. And then I'm going to have to be, I'm terrible at following budgets, but I'm either going to have to make more money to support my course buying addiction or I'm going to have to set a budget and stay within that budget and then evaluate what needs I truly have for the courses that I'm going to purchase. So I am not 100% sure of everything that is in the second largest category of the random stuff I paid. So, you know, we'll just table that for now because then the third largest is advertising. And advertising is no joke. That is usually a big expense, whether you call it advertising or marketing, getting your name out there so that you can get leads oftentimes costs a little bit of money. And so I spent on Facebook ads and then I'm going to go to my income tab, my income by category tab, actually. And I'm going to look at where my sales came from last year. And I only spent a few thousand on Facebook ads. But last year, I did not have any sales from Facebook, but I did have some sales from past client and sphere of influence. And okay, so we had 38 sales last year from referral, past client and sphere of influence. And I know some of those ads were directed to our database, like they were warm retargeting ads. So that's a very hard thing to know if the referrals, past client sphere of influence, if those were a result 
of the Facebook ads that we spent. So something to evaluate. And then we did have a pretty significant amount of money spent toward Google pay-per-click ads. And this is probably something that I will not purchase again. It was a short period of time that we did it. I let the contract fulfill and then I didn't renew it. And we did not get one sale. I don't even think that we're working with one buyer or one seller from any of those leads. And we had hundreds of leads and they were not great. So yeah, that's just not something that we're probably going to renew. So then one of our big advertising expenses was Zillow. And, you know, there's whether you love them or hate them, Zillow is a lot of times where people are going to look at houses. And so, you know, that 75% of my business comes from past clients, sphere of influence and referrals, but 25% comes from, well, not 25%. The rest of the sales comes from Zillow and then random things. So like I have one sale that came in through our website. We had one YouTube. We had one person contact us directly, one person through Remax, one person called us off of Google. And then we had eight sales from Zillow. So for Zillow, I spent just about 15,000 last year, but we made... 47,000, just over 47,000 in gross commission off of that. And so even when you take out the buyer agent split from that, it's still a moneymaker. So that is an expense that yes, it is a decent amount every month, but today it's still paying for itself. Now, the thing of that is I'm looking at 2022, but the truth is that 2023 is not off to a great start. We have two sales from Zillow and Trulia total in the hopper, and there should be more than that by now. But because there's such low inventory in general, then, and because houses are selling so fast, the opportunity for Zillow to capture leads to send to us is low. So it's really creating this, I mean, it's it's going to create a problem where if we are seeing in the next couple of months that we're not getting the return on our investment with Zillow, I'm out of there. So that's how I'm evaluating that. If you are making me money, I'll continue spending money. If I am not making money on this advertising, then it's possible that expense is going to be up on the chopping block to be considered to be eliminated. And then of course, you're always going to have those branding expenses like the Facebook ads that I talked about where it's not 100% clear if that actually worked for you or not, because it's just not because it's branding and you never truly know, like, did somebody see my ad on Facebook? And so then that's what made them go to YouTube. And then they went to our website to get one of our lead magnets. Who knows? It's really hard to tell in some cases like that. And so you just go through each category of these expenses and look at how much you're investing. And so right before I got on this call, my broker called me to answer a question about something unrelated to this. And I said, well, hey, while I have you, I'm getting ready to do a podcast on eliminating expenses. And I'm curious, like, what's your process to eliminate expenses? And he said, he's a broker. He's also a team leader, but he doesn't do any, he's not active in the business. He has a big team. He's got, actually, I think he has several businesses. So he's very high level. And his high level response was, oh, well, I'll get the P&L. <laughs> and I'm like, P&L? Is that a report from QuickBooks? <laughs> but he'll get the P&L and he'll look at things that were higher than last year or they're high in general. And he'll ask his staff for a more detailed report to see where that money is going so that you can look at what you can cut. And he gave an example that there was some $7,000 expense on his P&L, I guess. And so he's, what's this for? And his team said, oh, we're sending these postcards to this area. And he was like, what? I thought we stopped that. So, you know, they had a disconnect there. And at that point they stopped it, but that's $7,000 that he eliminated in his budget moving forward. And then he gave another example that last year they spent a crazy amount of money on sponsorships. And so this year, and I'm assuming that those sponsorships did not necessarily pay off. He didn't say, but if you're generally, if you're eliminating things, it's because they're not paying off for you. And so this year they set a cap budget 
on how much they were going to sponsor throughout the year. And so I think that limited it to like one school and one fine arts uh, sponsorship. So there's no one way to do it that's right for everybody. You just have to evaluate what's working for you. And if it's not working, consider if you need to continue that expense or not. And so then remember, chat GPT is all the rage right now. And I asked chat GPT, hey, give me a list of ways that a realtor can eliminate expenses. And so it wasn't a bad list. So number one, cut unnecessary subscriptions and memberships. Of course, what are you doing paying for a membership and you're not using it? So evaluate that subscription. Are you getting some sort of value just by being a member? You know, like I used to be a member of CRS, which is a designation that you can pay for. I think they changed it to RRC maybe. But at the time I was like, yeah, I'm a CRS and I'm so proud. But you know, I didn't get a single referral from CRS. It didn't generate any extra business for me. No one None of my clients knew what CRS stood for, let alone had any idea why they should value that designation. So it didn't really make sense for me to continue that subscription because I wasn't using anything that they provided and it wasn't generating me any business. So I canceled that ongoing expense for a designation and it did not hurt my business one bit at all. Now, I love CRS. I think it's a great organization. I think their classes are amazing. I really enjoy going to their annual conference celebration the multiple times that I've been there. But for me to continue being a CRS just because doesn't really make any sense. So then ChatGPT says, optimize your marketing expenses. Well, no kidding. No kidding, computer. (laughs) And we talked about that, evaluate what marketing channels are working and what aren't working. And you really have to have a good grasp of where your money is going and where your sales are coming from. And then here's another thing to think about. In the event that you're not really sure if the marketing efforts you're doing, so if you're, maybe you're doing a client party and, but you're not sure if you can attribute any of your sales back to the people who were at that client party. And maybe you have a couple of years of data that you can compare that to. Well, maybe you're not sure. So it's like, well, I could eliminate it or I might not. A deciding factor I would consider in that situation is whether you like to do it or not. So if it's making you money, keep doing it. If you're not sure if it's making you money, Do you like doing it? Because if you don't like doing it and you're not sure if it's making you money, I would eliminate it. Could always bring it back later. But if you're not sure if it's making you money and you really love it and you enjoy it and it fills your cup to have a client party or to do pop buys or whatever the thing is on your list that you're just not sure if it's actually making you any money business wise, but you love it, keep doing it. Like it doesn't always have to be about the money. It can sometimes be about the love, but if you know for a fact that it's not working, then I would ask yourself the hard question, why do you want to continue doing it? Like, what is it doing for you? Is it somehow feeding your ego in a way, like maybe the sponsorships for an example, maybe you get your logo on little league t-shirts, even though it's not bringing you any business, you love seeing your logo on the t-shirt. Is that really worth the expense? Like you could get your own t-shirt printed and wear it around with your logo on it. So of course, everybody's different and everyone does things their own way. Something to think about. And then chat GPT says, use technology to streamline your business. And I think that realtors are probably pretty damn good at doing that. And we also probably pay a lot of fees for our technology to streamline our business. And chat GPT probably wants us to start paying 20 bucks a month to them so that we can always log in. (laughs) So yes, use technology to streamline your business. But again, if you're not using it, if you're not getting enough value, like I have a subscription that's $17 a month for a technology and I probably should cancel it because I'm really not getting, I'm really not using it at all. And so that's currently on the chopping block for an expense that perhaps I should eliminate. And so even though we're using the technology to streamline our business, it can still add up and be a detrimental expense in the whole scheme of things. And then it also said, negotiate with vendors and suppliers. 
well, I don't think KB Core is going to start negotiating with me anytime soon. So, you know, it's possible if you have a vendor that you could call them and be like, hey, man, this isn't working for me. I'm thinking about canceling it. Do you have another program that might be more what I need? I don't know. I mean, nobody wants you to cancel their stuff. So if you were to call them and tell them, hey, here's where I'm at with this. I didn't get enough leads to warrant the cost. So I think I'm going to have to cancel unless you have something else that you can offer in exchange. They might give you extra credit. They might give you more leads. They might have a better suggestion on where to spend your money. I mean, every company is a little bit different. And some of them are going to be like, no, this is what it is. And if it's not working for you, go ahead and cancel. We don't care. Like Zillow, I'm pretty sure they don't care if I cancel or not because someone else will fill my spot probably immediately. Oh, this is interesting. The fifth tip from ChatGPT is manage your time effectively. Well, it's not really about eliminating expenses, but it's still a really good reminder. Thank you, computer, for telling me that time is money. Manage it wisely. (laughs) We should all be doing that all the time anyway. ChatGPT says consider shared office spaces. If you don't need a full-time office, consider renting a shared office space or co-working space. This can be more cost-effective than renting a full office space. Great suggestion. I don't know about you, but I have been 100% work from home since 2020. And I still have an office, but I no longer pay for that office because my brokerage changed. I don't know, like my brokerage is really cool and they just stopped charging us for office space. I think in 21, maybe 22. But I don't pay for it anymore. So it's not hurting me to have the office space. And if I did have to pay for it, well, I probably would consider eliminating it because we never go there. So if that's something that you're doing, then, you know, put it on the chopping block and see work 100% from home for the next month. Can you survive without an office? And maybe you can't. Maybe that is a valid expense, but maybe your broker would give you a smaller office or maybe your broker would be willing to negotiate with you on a different fee structure for your office. Or maybe, since we're talking about brokers, maybe you want to evaluate the value that you're receiving as a member of your brokerage. So I have changed brokerages twice in my real estate career. And the first time I was at a I mean, they're just like a local brokerage, but the split was like, I don't know, it was maybe I got to keep maybe 55% of my commission up until like 2 million in production. And then I got to keep maybe 60 or 65% of my commission, whatever it was, it wasn't great. And so at the end of, I think it was 2011, I looked at my numbers and I looked at where all my money was going and I looked at how much was going back to my broker. And that year I had paid over a hundred thousand dollars to my broker because that's what they kept out of my commission check. And I thought about what did I get for that? Yes, I have an office. Do I care about the office? Not really. Ooh, they put my picture in the newspaper for being a top producer. Who cares? They had leads, but they didn't give me any. And this broker would actually at the time, I don't know how they do it now, but at the time they would collect leads from their website, which was heavily trafficked. And then they would dole them out to their agents. And if you, it was like an IDX lead is what they called it. And if you got a sale, you had to pay a 20% referral fee back to the company plus your split. Cool. So I definitely did not get a hundred thousand dollars of value in that exchange. And so I shopped around and I decided to go to another brokerage where I felt like I would have more value. And so that worked for a couple of years. Then I built my team out and I don't know, they did something to make me mad. And so I called a couple other brokers to shop around, you know, that knee jerk gut reaction. Oh, well you did this. I'm going to do that. And so anyway, I found out, oh my God, I'm getting paid basically the same at any brokerage that I would go to, but my team would like, my team was paying around $18,000 a year per person in broker fees. And at the brokerage that we moved to, that reduced their fees from $18,000 to $3,600 a year, which is a pretty hefty pay increase as a buyer agent. 
So it made sense from the team perspective to actually go to the brokerage that I'm actually currently still there because the value remains. So, you know, they have great software. They're always thinking about their agents as the client and the support that we get absolutely is 100% in line with the value that I give to them out of my commission. We're receiving the same, if not more in that value exchange. So If you are not satisfied with the value exchange that you have with your current brokerage, it might be time to investigate your options. And you might find that the options, actually, you're at the best place. And so there's nothing wrong with confirming that your choice is still the best choice, but you might find that there are better choices out there. And even if you don't make a move, because it's a big deal changing brokerages, I get it. But even if you don't make a move, at least you are aware of what your options are. And then the last tip from ChatGPT was evaluate your transportation costs. If you're spending a lot of money on transportation, consider alternative options such as public transportation or carpooling to reduce costs. Well, I'm thinking this is a thumbs down answer from ChatGPT because like, yeah, I'll show you the house, but I'm not sure that the D-line goes to that address. So how about you pick me up at the bus stop and we'll carpool there. I had a friend once who told me that their realtor made them drive him around. So he was like, yeah, is that like a normal thing that they teach you at real estate school? Because every time I called so-and-so, he would say, oh yeah, pick me up at the office and we'll go look at the house. And I was driving him around which makes me laugh so hard because I mean, that's pretty clever. And this agent is still in the business and he's a pretty clever dude. So it just makes me giggle. But yeah, where I live, public transportation and carpooling is kind of funny, especially if you're carpooling. It means like your clients are riding with you. And I hate that. I hate my buyer clients riding with me. I want them to drive themselves because then then I don't have to do small talk with them. And I'm kind of a terrible driver. And I just don't like the stress of hauling people around and making this small talk. But if they're using their gas, like I feel like there is, it's a commitment on their part because then they are having those conversations privately with themselves where they're utilizing their time efficiently because their realtor isn't involved in the conversation and trying to sell them on a house they don't want. And then we can talk openly at the next place, whether like, what did you think? What did you talk about on the ride here? And then, yeah, like if you're going to go look at houses, I'm not a chauffeur, I'm a realtor. And so you can drive yourself there and spend your own money on gas because I learned that lesson the hard way. Having people just joyride with me who never had any intention of buying anything, but damn, they loved spending afternoons with me looking at homes. Whoops. That was a mistake that brand new agent Heather had to learn the hard way. So thanks chat GPT for suggesting carpooling. But no, most realtors are not going to be into carpooling with their competition, another realtor. And personally, I'm not into carpooling with my clients, especially because that doesn't save me any money. So you may have different opinion on those things and that's cool. You do you. But this podcast was all about managing your finances as a self-employed business owner, as a real estate agent. Hopefully you got some good tips on what to do and what not to do and how to evaluate the expenses that you have and perhaps consider some for elimination if you need to be watching your budget or if you're waking up in the middle of the night with cold sweats about, oh my God, how much did that cost me? Then this has probably been a good resource for you. And speaking of resources, check the show notes. I'll include a link where you can go and download my numbers tracker which also comes with uh, some video tutorials on how to use it because there are several pages or several tabs within the spreadsheet. And uh, well, I think tutorials are a nice thing to have when somebody just gave you a spreadsheet that you may or may not be, you know, super intuitive on how to use. So there you go. Happy expense elimination or expense justification, however you want to look at that. I'll talk to you next week.